yield the floor to Mrs. Sumeye to bring us through this um, third panel on peace building. Thank you so much, Christian. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening from Istanbul. I am Sumeya Semehabi from Islamic Cooperation Youth Forum. I'm working as project coordinator in ICYF. And I will be moderating the last session of this brilliant symposium. Uh, this session will host two valuable contributors who submitted papers in peace building temp. Before starting the session, I kindly would like to remind our speakers that you have only five minutes please make sure you complete your presentation in this time. Uh, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Ghazi Abdullah Muttakin, who is co-founder of Strategic Research Society in Indonesia. Uh, he will present his paper titled, The Meaning of Islamic Worldview, A Seminal Concept of World Peace, Unity and Solidarity. Mr. Garza, welcome, and please, floor is yours. Mr. Gazi, are you here with us? I think there is a technical problem uh, because he was here. Mr. Ghazi. Um, I think there is a problem with his microphone. Let's move uh, our other guest, who is Melody Amal Halil Kabalan to present her paper. Ms. Melody, are you with us here? Yes, I'm here. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Uh, she will present uh, his paper titled The Culture of Encounter and Interfaith Dialogue as the Basis of Building Peace. Uh, she is the president, is, uh, president Islam for Peace in Argentina, uh, which is regional body of RFP. Uh, welcome again. Please, floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Sister Sumeya. And thank you very much, uh, Professor Azakaram, uh, General Secretary of Religion for Peace, and uh, Taha Ahyan, uh, President of Islamic Cooperation Yaz Forum. Uh, I'm so glad to be here with all of you and to present this paper. I would like, um, just because we have only five minutes uh, to talk, that it will be impossible to, to, to talk about all the uh, ideas and the proposals for the NGOs and government for this, uh, for the YAS, um, sorry, for the basis of building peace through YAS. So I would like to focus on the responsibility of the uh, Fed institution. Uh, since now, uh, nowadays, since this year, I'm uh, a president of an Islamic institution, even I am a uh, Yas. Uh, so, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Uh, we know that uh, throughout history, we have seen how ethnic, religious, and cultural groups have been integrated into spaces of peace building. But it is very recent that young people have the opportunity and tools to demonstrate how through diversity, the richness of their culture and religion or faiths, traditions may be harnessed to generate peace building for the world society. Uh, on the paper, I inform you about the steps that young people have contributed in the peace building, uh, advantage and challenges focusing on Argentina and Latin America. Uh, I'm sure that if we uh, educate the earliest generation on peace, we have more opportunities for dialogue to be a way of life and not just a future goal. With regard to the relationship of YAS and their institutions, it must be borne in mind that 
said institutions should have an adequate program and personnel for young leadership, for young leadership, to work dynamically and with enthusiasm to improve the world that the young people perceive, and especially the need to engage with the religion or faith. One of the most common mistakes today, and the one we must work on, is that institution is segregating young people to yes issues. In most cases, activities, programs, and institutional or social commitment are not shared with the yes, believing that they could not understand the matter, or even worse, that they are not part of it. If we want to find a path and reach outcomes that allow young people to maintain a sense of belonging to their respective religions and engage in the problems of global society from religions and human standpoints, first of all, we must give young people the same room in time and place in the agenda that is given to others and understand that young people are also adults. Uh, that's why uh, the, responsa uh, um, the responsibility for engaging young people in religion is from the uh, uh, Fed institution. If young people cannot feel a sense of belonging, it is because they are being separated from the agenda of the institution. If we include yes in the institution agenda together with adults, young people will value being called, but especially their integration. This could be a confirmation that their discernment is as valid as that of those who have been in religion or faith institution for a longer time. We have to see the young uh, activities within the institution as an opportunity. Involving yes is a great opportunity to ensure the religious future in each of the institutions. Young people interact in different places, from the neighborhood, public transport, university, their first job, or outing with friends. All these non-religious spaces may be possible scenarios for a way of life where respect for diversity prevails. So first we have to strengthen the relationship of our institution with the young people, and then talk about how uh, to educate and to make the interfaith uh, programs. Young people should no longer be more uh, mere guests. They should be involved in the coexistent proposal. Every action, should be uh, requesting and taking an account in the same room with the young people. Um, I would like to tell you, just for finishing uh, my presentation, an example of something, a program that we are doing in Argentina uh, within the diversity network that is a, um, a conflict resolution uh, platform uh, that we found it with uh, interfaith uh, young people specialized in conflict resolution and interfaith. Uh, the last year, when the pandemic started, Diversity Network, we created the uh, Laboratory of Ethnic Culture and Religious Diversity of the, of the Buenos Aires City Legislative Body within the Human Rights Director under the auspices of UNESCO Montevideo here in Argentina. Amidst the pandemic, Diversity Network, together with the human rights that I mentioned it, uh, before, we found a forum where 15 young people of Abrahamic origin participated during a year of meetings with the aim of learning conflict resolution techniques and conversation, conversation with legislators and human rights-based NGOs. They learned about human rights and how to identify their violations. They also share religious festivities in virtual way, of course. And at the end of the first edition, they submitted a bill to work on religious diversity and prevent cases of ethnic 
or religious discrimination. And they created work uh, uh, commission. As a common goal, the laboratory creates encounters to understand diversity as well as training throughout education and knowledge of culture and the support of the state organization in this case within the framework of the Buenos Aires City Legislative Body is delivering and in which we, the coordinator, we incorporate three 2020 graduated from the, from the first edition as facilitators of the laboratory. Each facilitator belongs to one of the religious representatives in this program. Uh, there are endless opportunities for young people to engage with FEDS institutions and be agents of change by building peace communities. Religion institutions, we have a great responsibility to generate safe and inclusive spaces for yes, yes, sorry, to be part of the change and the process. Once we understand that there is a great benefit in having young people be leaders today and not of the future, we will prioritize the needs of an exchange with those who will carry the legacy of peace everywhere in the name of Sorry. our institution. Yes, Sorry. just one, one I sentence and... But uh, you exceed the time. Please wrap okay. up your speech. Thank you so much. Okay. So we will prioritize the needs of an exchange with those who will carry the legacy of peace building under the name of our institution. It is essential to work on education for peace building by young people. There is no time to wait to become older adults uh, to take on a peaceful and interreligious commitment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Melada Amal. This was truly inspiring speech. Thank you again. And I would like to give the floor to Mr. Ghazi. Uh, he's with us now. Uh, he will um, present his paper titled The Meaning of Islamic Worldview, a Seminal Concept to Build Peace, Unity, and Solidarity. Please, Mr. Ghazi, the floor is yours. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa mawala. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa hadahu la sharika la. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasulu anna al-ma'adu. The Honorable the President of ICIF, Mr. Toha Ayhan, His Excellency Professor Kutusmakasano, Her Excellency Abadu Toha Jatan, tonight is such an honor from the heart of faculty, the authority of our students in the to Islam as uh, the biggest religion in Sahara has a big role to share the civilization and society. By the interpreting many resources, it concluded that Sahara is a former name of Indonesia which derived from Javanese language, Nusantara. Nusa is island and Antara means other. Though Islam is not the first religion that has arrived in Nusantara, but the process of Islamization through spreading Islamic da'wah or Islamic worldview by the Cheddar, Ulama and Islamic missionaries or Mubali who rooted from the Middle East, India and Turkey or Ottoman Empire, which made Islam is the fastest growing religion in the center. The worldview or reference chart is an animal or the content of thinking characteristic of an individual group or culture. Ottoman Empire is the biggest Islamic empire in the 15th and 16th centuries. Ottoman spent its empire throughout Europe, Africa, Arab Peninsula, and the Southeast Asia. The objective of this research is to promote Islam as a peace religion among the youth to combat the Islamophobia disease. Qualitative method is used in this research to get better understanding of the issues by focusing solely on the corpus 
and the theoretical framework. Um, so one of the current problem uh, facing by Muslim generation is um, uh, combating Islamophobia. It's something that we live in peace and harmony with people of different faiths, including Christians, Jews, and others. Islam is a religion of peace in theory, principle, and practice that is against any form of oppression, discrimination, situative, persecution, and unjust killing of innocent, innocent souls. And then for the next slide about how Islam entered to Indonesia. Um, the arrival of Islam to the center was directly from Mecca or Arab Saudi. This process took place in the first century of Hijri or 7th century when the prophet was still alive. Islam arrival brought a big impact and encouraged progress to an advance and advancement the virtues and triumphant of the worldview, knowledge, culture, and daily language. And, and about the meaning of Islamic worldview. Uh, worldview can be said as a person's belief and thought at that function as the principle or motto of all human behavior. Islamic worldview is defined by Prophet al Atas, uh, namely the vision of reality and truth that appears be before our, our minds are revealing what existence is all about. In the Islamic worldview, the central or core concept with uh, or aspect of belief is Tawheed or the unity of God. To be a Muslim is to believe in the oneness of God. And about the differential aspect between Islamic worldview and Western worldview, uh, next slide, please. You can see uh, in my computer here. And for the conclusion, uh, making the historical roots relation between Ottoman Empire and Central, a lesson for cooperation, peace, and harmony. Um, as we know, Islam is a religion of tolerance, whatever it embraces, and the tolerant spirit will reside in the soul of followers on this of this religion. La min al The spreading of Islamic da'wah into the center is not sense effort. The plan of Islamization of the center was prepared since the sixth century and become a serious agenda by sophisticated strategy. In order to the citizen in Nusantara can accept the religion of Islam and can assimilate it with them. Uh, in the fact, is uh, is Indonesia is the largest Muslim majority country in the world with um, 85 of 230 million people follow Islam. The historical roots relations between Ottoman Empire and Nusantara or Southeast Asia is full of harmony, prosperity, cooperation, peace, and tolerance. Uh, it's it's Muslim who have a good Islamic worldview understanding will help non Muslim when affliction and adversity and are fair in applying the law. Muslim treat people with different opinion and beliefs in the right way. Now, though, although Muslims still show toleration, even though the other religions have been the persecution and detention of Muslims, residing in all parts of the world, even Muslims are suspected and accused of uh, being a uh, mastermind of terrorists or radicals. I want to show you um, many examples. For the first uh, world war, um, I'm sorry. For the First World War, 70 million killed caused by non-Muslims. And Second World War, um, 50 until 55 million killed by, caused by non-Muslims. Nagasaki atomic bomb, 200,000 killed by caused by non-Muslims. And the war in the Vietnam, over 5 million uh, killed caused by non-Muslims. So Islam is the religion of peace and justice. Islam is rahmatan lil alamin. Um, I think that's all my brief presentation. Allahu ya'kudu bi aydina ila ma fihi khayrun lil islami wal muslimin. Thank you very much for your um, attention. Uh, best regards from Indonesia. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Thank you so much, Mr. Ghazi, for this informative presentation. Now, I would like to move Dr. Sadiki uh, to make his presentation titled Green Islam and Reimagination of Khalifa, Ecopolitics and Muslim Youth Movements in South India. Dr. Sadiki is assistant professor in the Center for Development, Education and Communication. Uh, please, Dr. Sadiki, floor is yours. Mr. Sadiki, we can't hear your voice, unfortunately. Uh, good and morning. Yeah. Welcome, good please. Good afternoon. Good evening to everybody. Thank you for religion for these uh, OIS, OIS UIF and other partners for inviting me to present my paper on this uh, very interesting, very engaging uh, conference. So am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Please keep on. Okay. So my paper is basically on uh, uh, look the ways in which Muslim youth movements after 90s response to the question of ecological crisis and crisis of democracy in India by uh, interpreting their own faith resources as a claim to belonging and social performance. So uh, my paper looks how Muslim youth actors are negotiating and realizing the citizenship under the twin pressure of cultural Hindu nationalism that was uh, uh, emerging on that period in India and uh, uh, neoliberal shift in economy, uh, most of the developing countries, especially after 90s in India. Then it will look how, how does Muslim youth in minority context respond to changing socio cultural and political process such as globalization and rise of majoritarianism with the opportunities and constraints of being young, Muslim, excluded, and subject of social and political disciplinary practices. For that purpose, I will try to understand South Indian Muslim youth organization, Solidarity Youth Movement Kerala, attempt to engage in civic space by uh, rearticulating. Uh, some of the theological um, uh, uh, reinterpretation of some of the theological principles and all how they are engaging in ecological issues, other social issues by reinterpreting and re-engaging with the social within the uh, by uh, uh, by uh, uh, especially in, in a, a South Indian uh, context. So I am using um, here um, faith, religion, and citizen uh, faith and religion i am using here as a discursive formation discursive formation within the largest uh, space of socio-political changes that is happening and how it is mutually interacting the categories of religion youth and uh, 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 is islam so a larger global context in the 90s is very uh, uh, important to understand where I, how I am putting uh, the, uh, uh, these activities. For example, after the 90s, uh, especially in the developing countries, the decline of welfare, state moral, and emergence of ethical citizenry is one of the crucial uh, uh, things we have to be looked as a social process. So ethical citizenship uh, means it's a no longer found on the old welfare is the social contract uh, model uh, of national state, but being a neoliberal act of third felt moral solidarity, whereas citizen, citizen is enacted through the individual's dual care of self and care of other. The former welfare state, that is after uh, this uh, um, neoliberal political policies, uh, all the form of welfare state built on social citizenship, granting social rights by public provisioning of range of services seems to leave space to an age full of virtue where religious and social doctrines and notion of solidarity again merge together. Then volunteerism become one of the significant aspect of solidarity in, in place of state-led welfare varieties. On the one hand, the newly emerged welfare voluntary community see themselves as a moral community situated outside the purview of com commodified market relations 
and beneficiaries of state-led development initiatives. So they alternatively put their work as an act of compassion, care, and solidarity to construct a better society. This is one global context in which solidarity with youth movement also emerged. And on the other hand, there is a question of terrorism, war on terror discourse, and Islamophobia was also emerging on uh, 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 global ground. And the uh, decline of welfare state uh, uh, situated, uh, 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 created a two kind of uh, 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 civic space. One is protest politics and politics of governance. Protest politics means uh, their protest politics see source of ex a state as a source, uh, source of exploitation and injustice and see no possibility of liberation until what they call structural transformation takes place. But on the other hand, politics of governance prefer the art of governance. What is important now is that the governance of subject with the many identities and coming from many locations. So contrary to the old model of top-down governance, where secular democratic state control the population and structure the society accordingly, the new state emphasis on relations of power and is dispersed and variously negotiated by the subject at many levels. So this has led to the shift from social to ethical citizenship, from a priori compact of shared national welfare to collective belonging that must actively be paid through the localized participation. So in India also, these are, uh, these are the, some of the contexts in the 90s. All the uh, Nehruvian idea of uh, history politics largely changed. And the caste, religion, gender, community, and region have come to play a decisive role in the social and political uh, lives of India. Some of the political scientists say that it is deepening democracy that was happening in uh, uh, India. And on the other hand, the rapid growth of Hindu right wing, uh, communal, uh, communal violences, Ramjandi movement, Babri Muslim demolition, and gradual etherization of democracy, as uh, Christopher Jeffrold uh, uh, said. And marginalization of the Muslims, recognized by <coughs> the government, government itself, uh, the Sachar Committee report, and but Muslims are not considered as a constitutional category of welfare and development. So post Sachar, Muslim political discourse replaced the previous focus of cultural symbols such as Muslim personal oil to that of economic and social conditions of Indian Muslims. So these are the, some of the conditions. In context, the specific southern state Kerala, Kerala uh, is uh, famous for the Kerala development model. Uh, it is uh, Kerala is the state where the first uh, communist government was elected uh, in 1957. Later, you know, Kerala uh, famous for public action, social development, and uh, uh, one of the interesting thing happened after 90s that left to replace the its ideological category class by people to increase. People participation in governance. So shifting notion of class structure, social hierarchy, worship patterns, family structure, and above all, religion and music in Kerala also visible in the 90s. So solidarity youth Dr. movement, King, youth movement emerged you. in this Dr. period. But, Can you hear me? Sorry to interrupt, but please wrap up your oh, um, speech yeah. because we already exceed the time. Thank you. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Uh, so I will just wrap up. Uh, solidarity emerged in this uh, period uh, by uh, 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 engaging citizenship politics, by radically reinterpreting re their theological standpoint in response to the changing social uh, culture and politics. You can see that solidarity as a social activist group actively engaged in civil society and grassroots movements on social justice, environmental protection, and human rights violation. And uh, uh, some of the, uh, and uh, in apart from many struggles, Solidarity also engaged in voluntary activities, and solidarity has also ensured that in its all activities, uh, it transcends all barriers of faith, language, caste, and creed, and in doing so, that have become a significant force of the social fabric of Kerala. This is was the already noticed by scholars that uh, as an attempt within Muslim community to transcend so sectarian divide and reach out to other community and have a dialogue and establish solidarity with the various issues. You can see here uh, uh, solidarity leaders have been. Uh, um, uh, welcomed by uh, then some of the interesting theological uh, formulation. For example, for that they are reinterpreted uh, many uh, theological formulation. For example, Anna's solidarity justified their position by citing two reasons. On the one hand, they argued that the, the religious difference and the question of salvation remain a specific issue. Islam also offers some universal value and ethics which can be followed by every human being. The center of Islamic teaching is Anna's. Islam and the prophets were always introduced as a common heritage of masses 
and for the masses. So in interfaith solidarity on the issues of justice is possible with the person who does not share the same vision of salvation of Muslim share. So then Fasad and Tahmir, uh, the world has precedently witnessed the clashes between the forces of Fasad and forces of uh, Tahmir, means uh, 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 reconstruction. So uh, then uh, the notion of Khilafa, they interpreted as a uh, uh, very interesting way, uh, that is uh, intervention of human being with the history, will and partial autonomy in that process, uh, in, in that process we call development. The partial autonomy is the ontic status of human being on the earth, the Quran called the state of Khilafa. Kila, uh, so uh, uh, that the proper care of earth is not possible without ecological morality and care of earth is entitled upon human being as Khalifa of Allah. Uh, then Imaratul Arum and uh, their development vision, they have done many on uh, uh, sustainable development, uh, uh, eco-friendly development and all. So uh, that uh, I am not uh, uh, giving uh, uh, further details. So uh, in conclusion, what I am saying that so that emerged as the expression of new conception of ethical system. Citizenship, ethical citizenship is the way by which inform, involve, and civically engage with the members of the community and educate their values, beliefs, reasoning through the written, spoken, symbolic discourse and social action, and uh, exploring various possibilities of re reconceiving the idea of doing politics. It proposes understanding people's engagement for advancing individual and social freedom, justice, well being, and happiness as eco politics. Uh, as a recommendation, largely. So uh, the experience Thank of Thank you so much, but Dr. Uh, Sadiq, I have to cut uh, with, with you, one minute, one minute. our time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this excellent contribution. Now I would like to give floor to Mr. Trehatin Mohamed Sabar to present his paper titled His Journey to Interreligious Dialogue for Peace, Introduction to an Interreligious Dialogue through Gang. Please, Mr. Mohammed, the floor is yours. Mr. Mohammed? We can hear your voice, unfortunately. I think there is a problem with your mic. Yes, I, we cannot hear you. What's it now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'm going to to share with all uh, about, about the interreligious uh, tool that we already try to uh, find here. So interreligious has remained bilateral, different more titular, but also become global. It's now spreading in all societal structure. And fundamentally, dialogue means I can learn from you. According to Diana Ek, uh, he categorized interfaith dialogue into five, which are the dialogue of life, dialogue of dialogue of learning, dialogue of doing, and more uh, philosophical and theological dialogues which is reflection or self-dialogue. And in this uh, research, I'm trying to introduce a learning tool of interreligious dialogue. The project on the creating interreligious dialogue actually had been discussed and produced by the NGOs in Europe, especially at Juventa, Serbia, TDM, Italy, and then the others as well from Turkey, Austria, and France. They are trying to look for something that could be done by people in the grassroots uh, in terms of religious dialogue. And they create a number of interreligious dialogue, including the pilgrimage and hello and the holy memo. This tool is actually bring the youth to talk about religion, their belief, and this also to promote interreligious dialogue by sharing the fact and also, you know, like promote freedom of religion and belief, speech and choice, right to equality, marriage and family tolerance, drug sharing. And in addition that they also, this tool uh, is be able to be learned by playing and all the players all age while playing are able to learn about religious symbol, custom, and also to raise the awareness about the different religions and belief in the world, as well as to stimulate the interreligious dialogue among participants. In the context of Indonesia, then I and my team try to make uh, also the inter uh, inter dialogue tool, which is uh, peace journey. 
I'm trying to get uh, this screen sharing. Is there a is there a problem with your screen sharing? Yeah. The okay. This one is uh what uh how this tool look likes and then this is the other ones and this is uh, the peace journey that i try to make with my community in indonesia which is a peace journey uh, it is actually a religious tool that is made uh, to see in the religious issues in indonesian context it's about an educative game and as an inter religious dialogue tool that can be played in a fun way. The objective of this tool is actually to increase participants' knowledge level about religious diversity in Indonesia, also to give the participants an opportunity to stimulate inter-religious dialogue, as well as promote tolerance, respect, and peace. And in this tool, there is a judge that we call by Peace Hero, and then the participant of the this game is a peace ambassador and then the physical form of this game is actually a puzzle that can be arranged to become a board and the board game contains a pictures of religious diversity in indonesia consisting of symbols ritual and keyword of Sikh recognized religion and some certain registered one plus a picture of a circular stair the board called the holy peace land and then there's also the holy book of peace journey that contains academic information of the religious diversity in indonesia and uh, it, to sum up about this tool actually is that it is expandable adaptable and youth involving reflective contemplating and also can be played in a fun way just like the existing tools that we already uh, play in my community in some school as well I'm going to go to the next slide. It's still in process, I think. So the three crucial steps in the Peace Journey game is that one is arranging the puzzle. As I mentioned earlier, that the puzzle is actually containing a picture of religious diversity in Indonesia, consisting of symbol, ritual, and keyword of Sikh recognized religion, and some certain registered ones. This part challenges participants to unite random pieces of puzzle. And when the entire pieces of puzzle get arranged correctly, the board will be showing participants a visual of Indonesian religious diversity, including a circular stair of the game. The next second, the, the second step is peace adventure. This stage allows participants to play a game, just like a snake stair game. On the game board, in every stop, there will be a question about religion, such as religious question, reflection, or also action. For example, what is a horse of worship in Islam? The, the answer should be masjid actually. And then you are a Muslim and being invited to a birthday party celebration of your Christian friend. How do you respond it? And then Amato group takes care seriously of environmental preservation. How does your religion teach so? Great Friday is a ritual of blah, blah, blah tradition. Would you like to perform adhan or meditation or else, etc. The question and answer of the game refer to the Holy Book of Peace journey as all information and material is written there. And then the last but not least step is the briefing or reflection moment. To begin the briefing session, the judge kindly ask the participants to reflect on their Indonesian religious diversity and ask some of them to share their thoughts with others. After that, the judge explained in brief about tolerance, respect, and peace according to the Holy Book of Peace Journey based on the theoretical framework, then ask the participant to reflect on them. And then the judge invites some of the participants to share their point of view about their feeling of tolerance, respect, and peace during the game. And the discussion is open welcomely during the entire of this part. During the whole of the game, all participants are completely encouraged to make some talk, dialogue, discussion, and share their own perspective or real religious life-related experience. The judge is responsible for this encouragement. To be noted that actually there's maybe one more thing to be done in this part of the game is that peace declaration. Please, peace declaration in a circle formation that people are uh, saying something together in terms of being peace, in terms of being a peacemaker, and also in harmony way. And then, uh, if I should conclude, I would say that the peace journey, this is a tool that I'm actually still working for, is an alternative to conduct interreligious dialogue that presents religious diversity of Indonesian context. And the contents are designed to increase participants' knowledge level about religious diversity. Meanwhile, the process of the dialogue through non-formal learning 
promotes among the players mutual understanding of respect, tolerance, and so peace. We encourage this tool can be spread more hard. wider, starting from secondary junior school until the high school, and also with uh, the content in the coffee shop as well. So uh, last but not least, I would say that if people ask what uh, people of the level grassroots could enjoy the interfaith dialogue, this such tool could be one of the answer. That's all. Thank you, Salam, and uh, see you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Pratin, uh, for this uh, inspiring presentation, uh, which covers the issue from very different perspective. Um, I would like to move our last contributor of uh, our symposium, Mr. Riaz Rawat, to present his speech titled How Religion and Faith Can Remain True While Connecting with Secular Agendas Led by Government and Business Such as Employability. Please, Mr. Riaz, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sumeya. Uh, good afternoon and best wishes to all of you from the United Kingdom. Uh, now, I have to start off by saying that uh, there are advantages of being the last speaker at a two-day conference, a wonderful two-day conference, and that is that I have heard so many contributions. You don't really want to hear me speak, do you? Everything that I was going to say has already been said today and yesterday, so maybe we call it quits so we all go home early. Um, I wish that was the case. I wish that was the case, but no, 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 far from it. Uh, I do have a PowerPoint presentation. If I can share that with you, that would be most helpful. Uh, I will. Can you all see that? Um, yes, Mr. Vyas. Thank you. Screen sharing. Can you all see that? Yes, yes, we can see it. Yes. You can, lovely. Okay, so um, let me begin with this. Okay, so I am Riaz Ravat. I am Secretary General of Baraza. I also work for an organization called St. Philip Center, which is based in the United Kingdom. So what is Baraza? Who are we? Well, Baraza is a Swahili word, meaning council or meeting place. It is a place where we get together, um, and that more or less tells you about the organization, the kind of spirit that we operate within. Whilst I speak to you from the UK, in fact, our headquarters are in Munich, in Germany. Uh, we have a, a small group of staff, advisors, associates, uh, and members. And I would say that our values are understanding, acceptance, and coexistence. Where do they come from? Well, they come from a project that we ran for the Sultanate of Oman, which was based on their exhibition of tolerance, understanding, and coexistence. Uh, and their message of Islam and working with and living alongside other faiths. And that project really became the pioneer for our existence back in 2017. Uh, I describe ourselves as a tiny but tenacious organization. Uh, we are very small in staff, but uh, we do have energy and we are very much action minded. And I hope that I can illustrate through a couple of examples what I mean by that. Now, I'm going to. Um, sit you all a test. Uh, I don't need answers on the chat facility, that's fine. Uh, I will let you judge for yourself how many of these you get correct. But if you have a look at this screen in front of you, can you guess which religion or belief these individuals belong to? So I won't eat into too much of my time. I know Sumeya will hold me to account. So very quickly, I'm assuming most of you will be correct. Now, let's. Have, I gave you the answers there. How terrible was that? Anyway, uh, have a go at these. These are a bit more challenging, I would say. You probably may not get to 100%. You may get near there. But this is a bit more complicated. And the answers are here. And the last two slides, this one and the previous one, illustrates to you the recipe that we operate within, that we want young people to think critically. We want young people to think outside of the box. We want to avoid stereotypes and prejudices, which are all too easy. Now, I'm going to talk about two particular engagements that Baraza is involved with. One is on the left, our coloring book for children. And on the right uh, is our unity program for a slightly older age range. Now, 
my symposium paper, which uh, I know you will all see, it talks about both projects, but the coloring book is available in 16 different languages. It's used by many schools and families in many parts of the world. In fact, only this month, this past month, it formed part of an a exchange between children in Uttar Pradesh in India and children in Leicestershire in the UK. They formed a, a unity and a, and a link on the back of that. Now, this book is available freely to download on our website, so please do have a, have a look at that. The other scheme is Unity, you'll see there. Uh, now, Unity is our flagship leadership program. It is a life skills initiative. It is equipping young people with the tools that they will need for life. And I'm really pleased that some presenters earlier, particularly Kennedy, I will cite him, who set us some, very rightly, a number of very significant challenges. If we are in this space doing this work, are we addressing the real challenges that emerge? And Unity is uh, an extremely deep program from our perspective. It's one which uh, is based on some shared learning from the United Kingdom, a program called Catalyst, which was run a number of years ago. And we've used the context to apply this within Germany. And we cover self-confidence, uh, issues around liberty, critical thinking, team building, job skills, presentation skills, social action, the environment, and decision making, for example. It's available as sessions, but also as an academy, a week-long academy. And about two weeks ago, we delivered some teacher training in a school in Munich, in Germany. And this will now be part of the formal curriculum from September. We are delighted by that. I see Unity as a metaphorical toolbox for life. It will give young people, we hope, the, sk the skills and the utensils they will need to walk through the door of future success. Now, moving onwards with regards to uh, my recommendations, and this will be the, the last slide, uh, mindful of the, the time. I won't talk about all 10, of course, but I will highlight a number of these, uh, just a few for reference. Uh, personal encounters, parking prejudice. My paper demonstrates thoroughly through research and anecdotal examples that when people meet people, barriers are reduced and a feel-good factor is created. Now, whilst online communication has been mandatory during the pandemic, it cannot replace the value of human engagement and human encounter. Prayer plus purpose, religious and belief organizations come in many shapes and sizes, with diversity their greatest strength. However, this discourse need not be dominated by liturgy. There are examples in my paper of how faith-based organizations are offering prayer, but also purpose, which helps young people. And the global faith sector must recognize the wider provisions within its umbrella, such as social action, or indeed contributions towards helping the environment. Universality, human life, regardless of religion or belief, must be cherished and valued. My paper shows how faith-based organizations can engage effectively with young people who are passive or even hostile to religion, because the case for understanding, respect, and acceptance has many facets to it. Alliances of hope, in order to translate words to actions and to move from aspiration to sincerity, religious and belief leaders and organizations must commit to tackling and speaking out against hate across the peace, even when it is committed from within. Sound safeguarding, faith has enormous power and appeal to an overwhelming majority of people in the world. This authority, however, comes with responsibility. And so creating policies, practice, and cultures which safeguard the health, well-being, and safety of young people to build trust and confidence are vital. Systems which are open to scrutiny, accountable in pr process, and proportionate in justice are non-negotiable. And sharing across the ages, uh, all too often people who are from older groups are dismissed as being backwards or indeed irrelevant. Uh, this is not only wrong, but it's discriminatory and also misguided because life stories and learning are invaluable examples of how soft skills can be developed. And I make a plea here for intergenerational activities which should be supported. Thank you very much for listening. I hope I've committed myself within the five minutes. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Riaz. Uh, this was the last presentation of our symposium, uh, and we already exceed, exceed our time. That's why, unfortunately, we haven't got time for question and answer. But uh, there is a general question in question and, uh, in chat box, and I would like to direct this question to our dear contributors uh, who wants to answer uh, it in one minute can answer this question. Uh, question is, a lot of issues are affecting Muslim youth. One of them is about the woman issue, like women targeted compared to men. People, even Muslim, misunderstood that an Islamic perspective appears to be limiting the movement of women. But when we look at the history of Islam, it is not curved. My question is, what what must a young person to do change that perspective? This is a general question to our dear contributors. I think Harold I'm went before me, but I'm happy to, yeah, proceed. Do you want me to speak, Harold? Please. Okay, okay, okay sure. Sure. Uh, okay, Mr. Rias, please. Yeah, thank, th thank you. Uh, well, in one of my recommendations, I spoke about uh, alliances of hope. And I will challenge people who are outside of the group in question. So we are talking here about the role of women. Now, women speaking up for women, we expect that, we'd know that. What we need are men to speak up for women. That's what you call an alliance of hope. And if I give you one example of that, in our Unity program, We've made it a condition that we will deliver this if at least 50% of the participants happen to be females. And this requires us to be bold, be brave, but also to challenge organizations. There is simply no point in us talking the talk, but then when things work out on the ground, we walk away from it and just carry on as we were doing before. We have to push ourselves and push those that we work with to see real and lasting change. And that's just one example that we've done. We've said we've got to have 50%. If we don't have 50%, you've got to go back and try and recruit more people for us. It, it's just not good enough. So I think we do need to challenge ourselves and challenge others. Thank you so much, Mr. Rez. I think we have come to end to, come to, end to our session. Uh, it was a spectacular experience for me personally, being part of this excellent occasion. I would like to thank everyone who have been part of this historic event. Now we can conclude our session. Uh, thank you so much, our contributors. Uh, Mr. Christian, you can take the floor. Thank you very much, Mrs. Wuyuk and all the, pan the panelists for um, sharing these uh, insightful presentations. I'm sure everyone has learned something from different processes and tools shared uh, and used to engage youth in action towards peace building. Now we are going to the end of our symposium, but it's time to take some reflections on key takeaways. And uh, it is a privilege for me to invite Dr. Catherine Marshall from Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs at Jota University to share with us her reflections on key takeaways. Dr. Marshall, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, this has been a, a, an extraordinarily interesting and challenging uh, two days, I think. The, the topic is, um, is a vitally important one. As, as I said in the very beginning, we always need to remember that youth may be the future, but they are also very much the present. Uh, and that demands and calls on us to change from a rhetorical focus on youth, where we admire and, and love youth and mention them repeatedly, to finding the most effective ways to engage youth uh, in the dialogue. And that means both hearing voices, uh, but also hearing the agendas. In other words, what are the priorities? How do the priorities differ? I think another theme is that we very much uh, look to intergenerational dialogue. 
that is a balanced, creative, and I think demanding dialogue where we challenge each other uh, in different ways. So the rich diversity of the presentations here, rich and diverse because they come from different places, different religious perspectives, but also uh, different topics is important. Um, the most um, significant topic though, as we look ahead is where we are on the journey. And this, uh, this symposium is designed to provide ideas and grist, real material uh, for the next few months, particularly, which are extraordinarily demanding months uh, in the global agenda. And I would hazard also as very demanding uh, historic points, uh, the Kairos moment, uh, when as we emerge, we devoutly hope from the COVID emergencies uh, that we will all collectively uh, be taking advantage of the opportunity to rebuild and to rethink, to look at our strategies, to look at our mechanisms as we go forward. So we are now almost in August uh, 2021, and the months ahead are extraordinarily demanding. Uh, I'm personally very much looking to the G20 Interfaith Forum, which takes place in Bologna in September. Uh, the G20, the group of 20 nations or 19 plus the EU, has within the international system a priority uh, mandate looking to crisis management. Uh, and uh, Professor Azza Karam will be one of the leading keynote speakers uh, setting the agenda for the Interfaith Forum, which is essentially arguing and presenting religiously inspired perspectives for the global agenda overall. And I highlight that at the end of that meeting, the mantle, the mantle, the baton for the G20 uh, interfaith will pass from Italy, which is the 21, uh, 2021 host to, um, to uh, Indonesia, which is the host for the G20 for 2022. So that forum has um, a, a strong focus on youth uh, and, I'm very hopeful that as we work together in the months leading up to September, that we can draw some of the inspiration from the presentations here uh, to, to that forum. More significant for the Religions for Peace community uh, is the event that will take place in Lindau in Germany in the beginning of October. Uh, and the plan is that on this continuing journey, the presentations that have been heard here, and I think a few others, uh, will be discussed with you individually. Uh, we may also be able to have a, a broader collective discussion uh, put together into a, a, a publication, uh, which will be presented at the Lindau meeting uh, to put a, a sharp and a very practical emphasis on the youth challenges, the challenges uh, that I described uh, as both the prophetic voice. In other words, what is the bold vision for the future uh, that comes from young people who are unencumbered with so much of the baggage of the past but also what are the practical things people are doing, but also the practical dreams that they have. And I will end with um, um, a favorite quotation of mine that um, was actually used by Bobby Kennedy uh, and, be, and others, uh, which is, I see things, uh, you see, sorry, you see things and you ask why. I dream things that never were, and I ask why not. Uh, that's a Bernard Shaw uh, 
quotation from what might be um, a biblical but inappropriate uh, inappropriate location, which is the serpent speaking to Adam and Eve. In fact, I think it was says the serpent's question, but that doesn't make it uh, <laughs> a less uh, significant uh, challenge and inspiration to all of us to dream things that never were the way that we would like the world to be just, equitable, respectful, joyful, uh, peaceful, all of those things that we, we seek and that we look to better ways uh, to translate them into reality. So I look forward to continuing this intergenerational journey uh, that is founded on a profound respect and caring uh, for the younger generations, including children, uh, but also looking to something of the wisdom which we hope some of our elders, myself included, have accumulated over the years. So congratulations to all of you. Uh, thank you and look forward to the continuing journey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Marshall. Now it's uh, time for us to hear the concluding remarks. And it's a honor and a privilege for me to invite Dr. Azakaram to share with us her concluding remarks. Thank you very, very much indeed, Mr. Christian Lupemba. And a special thanks also to your co-mistress of ceremony, Ms. Noor, who did a beautiful job leading us yesterday as well. Um, I think as with every other such massive gathering, the folks who take our hands and walk us through from the masters of ceremony to those who are moderating are always some of the most important leaders in a space of joint uh, journey. So a special thanks to all the moderators from yesterday and today. I want to thank each and every one of you. Please allow me to do two things and I will try not to speak as fast as I usually speak. I will try to speak much more slowly, but I need to do <laughs> two big things. The first is the formal honoring with gratitude a number of people uh, who made this gathering possible. The second is to share a few reflections with you. Allow me to begin with the former formal honoring of um, His Excellency Mr. Taha Ayhan from the Islamic Cooperation Youth Forum and the wonderful support that he has received um, and guidance that all of us have received from Dr. Fadila Grain, um, Ms. Noor, and a whole team of expert, capable people within the Islamic Cooperation Youth Forum. But I would be very remiss if I don't mention the other co-sponsors who have made this a unique gathering of minds, of hearts, of intellect, and of spirit. I refer here very specifically to Dr. Lillian Sison from the Pontifical and Royal University of Santo Tomas in the Philippines, who is also the Secretary General of Religions for Peace Philippines. That's our interreligious council present in Philippines. Dr. Sufat Metyun Yasset from the Institute of Human Rights and Peace Studies at Mahidol University and another woman Secretary General of Religions for Peace in Thailand. Dr. Catherine Marshall, whom you've just heard, who is to me, a mentor, not because she's an elder or thinks herself <laughs> elderly, but precisely because her mind and her intellect encompass so much wisdom and experience. Dr. Marshall came with, as usual, with many, many hats, um, one of which is the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs at Georgetown University, but the other is also the executive director of the World Faiths Development Dialogues, which is the first interfaith space that was created inside a multilateral by means by which I mean intergovernmental space that we knew of, uh, which was in the World Bank. And Dr. Catherine Marshall continues her innovations in those interfaith spaces by now also leading the G20 Interfaith Forum, which is becoming a singular space to connect with the group of 20 governments and interfaith communities around the world. 
I also want to thank Dr. Matthew Weiner from the Office of Religious Life at Princeton University. We sorely missed his wisdom and his presence with us, but he assured us that he was with us in spirit. What makes this meeting incredibly remarkable is something that I need to give a special personal thanks to, um, again, Mr. Taha Ayhan, and especially to Dr. Fadila Grain, and that is the presence of giants in the Islamic world, giant institutions who are contributing enormously and who sadly looking at the global space often don't get a quarter of the respect, esteem that they absolutely deserve. And who am I speaking about? I am speaking about the Statistical Economic and Social Research and Training Center for Islamic Countries, CESRICH, I am speaking of the Interna International Islamic Fiqh Academy, and I'm speaking of the Research Center for Islamic History, Art and Culture. These are giant institutions with a contribution to humanity, which fully deserves to be not only respected, but deliberately systematically taken into account. I am grateful for the institutions in the Western world who have set, come together with our Islamic institutions to make this discussion and conversation possible. And I think all of us need to appreciate that this does not happen every day. This is a unique coming together of institutions from the North and institutions from the South to convene a space of learning, of shared wisdom and of insight. And I want to thank these institutions and to show clear respect to each and every one of them. I also want to share with you that I learned a tremendous amount from each and every one of you over the last two days. There is, there is no way to encompass the wealth. One of you said it beautifully yesterday, there is simply so much richness of knowledge, it's mind boggling. It is true, you have come and shared so much wisdom, so much knowledge. It is also true that as young people, relatively, you are fashioning the discourse of today. And I, for one, feel deeply enlightened and deeply humbled by what you have shared. Allow me to ask you, as we go forward on this journey, allow me to ask you to appreciate one another more deliberately, more systematically. There is a beautiful verse in the Holy Quran which says that a kind word, a good word, is like a beautiful tree with roots deep in the earth and branches that reach to the heavens. Can you imagine that beautiful metaphor of such a tree? This is what a kind word is. Never take kind words shared with one another lightly. You are building our forest of cohesion, but also of, as um, Ms. Mirabai said yesterday very beautifully, um, this is the spiritual empowerment that you are uniquely capable of building for us. We speak about empowerment as though it's one thing that we must give to someone else. Effectively, spiritual empowerment is how you empower one another through the power of the work that you do together, the service that you do together. It doesn't have to be a major NGO that is created. It doesn't have to be a major transnational global initiative. It can be something as small as reaching out a hand in sympathy and a smile to a stranger in the street. You used, some of you, some beautifully intricate terminology in what you were sharing. And I would say to you, kudos, but I would also beg you to consider that the simpler the language of our communication, especially when we communicate across so many cultures. We have had people here from Latin America and the Caribbean. We've had people from Asia, the Pacific. We've had people from Africa. We've had people from uh, the Arab world. We've had people from Europe. This diversity that Professor Catherine Marshall noted is one of our challenges is also the strength, but it will become a strength when we are able to speak to one another in language that is not using terribly complex terminology, in language that comes from the heart and still expresses the, the passion and the wisdom that otherwise many academics use and write in very complicated ways. We don't need complex terminology to communicate the passion and the love and the spirit that we need to share with one another. 
I also want to share with you this, and many of you spoke about this. We have a lot to learn about each other's faith traditions. We have a lot to learn about each other's cultures as they are informed by these faith traditions. There is never enough learning. When it comes to our faiths and our cultures, there is never a moment of, okay, I figured it out. I understand now. I can do this. Never. We have been created diverse in order to continue to learn about and from one another. There is no plateau of learning about each other's faith. It is a constant process. That is why in Religions for Peace and in many other interfaith organizations, the commitment to continued learning and the humility that that requires is absolutely essential. Many of you have shared stories about the work that you're doing, how valuable these stories are, because stories are what all faith traditions originally came to us in. It was all about stories, the stories of different prophets, the stories of um, Jesus, the stories of um, the gods and goddesses of old. Stories are the very fabric and the threads of our spiritual lives together. So continue to share your stories. And please realize, we reached out in Religions for Peace to many institutions here in the United States, institutions of great repute and great learning. The ones that showed up and contributed are the ones with whom there is a personal ongoing relationship with members in the Religions for Peace movement. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because at the end of the day, the relationships you build with one another will far outlive and outweigh any institutions that you build. So focus on the relationships. Don't worry too much about the institutions. Focus on the relationships as you have been doing in these last two days. Realize that with these relationships, we build, we connect our spirit. And that is precisely what this is all about. You have taught me this in the last two days. I look forward to walking with you on this journey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Karam, for these words of wisdom. Now I have the honor to invite Dr. Fadila Grain, Senior Advisor of Islamic Cooperation and Youth, for her concluding remarks. Peace be upon all of you. Um, actually, uh, it came to me by surprise just a few minutes ago that Mr. President has some circumstances and I have to read his final um, uh, remarks. And it gives me the honor uh, to actually be with you again uh, in this, to be with you again uh, today in this platform. I have been sitting here for two days and uh, learning so much learning so much from uh, our presenters, from uh, our beloved uh, participants, and uh, it has been a tremendous organization. So let me start first by thanking uh, uh, Her Excellency Prof. Dr. Azza, my dear sister, uh, for her uh, inspiring uh, existence and presence among us, uh, for her hanging uh, this uh, idea and making out of it what we are experiencing in these two uh, wonderful days. Uh, and we are actually uh, progressing and doing uh, uh, what we have been uh, dreaming of. So, uh, dear Dr. Azza, uh, Excellencies, our dear partners, presenters, distinguished uh, guests, and also our wonderful young people, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, actually, this symposium on youth engagement throughout religion and faith in the 21st century was indeed a wonderful occasion that brought us together for the sake of youth who continue to play different roles in the betterment of communities and the building of harmonious societies and to explore means for better engagement, intellectual exchange, useful research for many uh, complex challenges uh, facing our youth today. This is done by the youth themselves uh, throughout the eyes of youth, uh, looking uh, on through the lenses of their faith and traditions. We heard this yesterday, uh, since yesterday and today from youth in this platform, uh, actually interesting how the values and the faith are uh, one and the human race uh, is actually, uh, is, is very yani, clearly communicating through hearts when it comes to the faith. We all feel uh, 
togetherness and we feel we can actually hearts can be harmonious and we can uh, be at the same uh, level and the same time in the same on the same uh, platform the international events uh, we experienced since yesterday is a set of uh, youth seeking to capitalize on faith and engage through belief in God to make better and more peaceful world. And uh, intellectuals, experts, wise scholars, uh, great uh, speakers uh, were uh, mentors and we were, we were privileged to listen uh, to them. And we look forward to them to continue to mentor our young people uh, to, to um, in their struggle or long struggle to counter global challenges uh, through faith uh, and knowledge and wisdom. And that's why this symposium uh, is actually uh, organized. So ICYF, uh, we profoundly appreciate the significance of this uh, symposium and this success alongside uh, this valuable uh, partnership, especially with Religious for, uh, uh, for Religious for Peace and the rest of our esteemed uh, partners uh, and, and contributors. There's so many, I'm sorry, I don't just want to take a long time, but uh, we all uh, actually appreciate each and every effort has put together from our uh, contributors and uh, partners uh, in this uh, journey of uh, trying to achieve a day like this to sit and talk about our faith all together uh, in a very peaceful and beautiful way. On this very special occasion also, I would like to thank Religions for Peace, ICYF team, uh, for their uh, remarkable efforts. They have been working harmoniously and uh, hard, hard work uh, was put together and outstanding contribution uh, which, which made uh, this uh, possible and uh, congratulations to both teams. Uh, many, many thanks to Dr. Catherine Marshall for, uh, from Berkeley, uh, Berkeley Center for Region Peace from Georgetown University for her uh, takeaway reflections. Uh, we really appreciate each and every word and each and every um, heartbeat you put into this effort. Very special thanks to the keynote speakers, Dr. Qutub Sanu, the Secretary General of the Academy, Dr. Br uh, uh, Pritbal uh, Kaur uh, Ahlawalia, the co-president of Religions for Peace, Dr. Mustafa uh, Sirik, and I agree with him that uh, Dr. Azza should be the, the mother of Hraira because of her beautiful cat. Uh, also, uh, all the others who contributed today uh, to make this uh, remarkable contribution into this wonderful symposium. It was our, our honor to spend the last two days learning from the keynote addresses and the well-presented papers of this symposium and the comments uh, on the questions of the esteemed participants and the youth um, I, among others, have enjoyed the presence of scholars, experts in the company of uh, many uh, young people from all over the world, as Dr. Hazza put it rightly, from all over the world. Every single part of the world, they were with us since yesterday. All committed to celebrate faith in action, connect the dots, answer the difficult questions, and inspire maybe ask more questions and inspire our youth to move forward with confidence, assurance, and certainty, living their lives as people of faith, who, are, uh, who care about the wellness and the prosperity of the human family. The symposium completes its many sessions, scholarly papers, contributions, rich discussions with tremendous success, in my opinion. For that, I would like to extend the highest respect and the most sincere gratitude to the joint efforts of all the scholars, experts, contributors, guests, participants, and representatives of the esteemed institutions and universities who were with us in this symposium. Our exemplary participation further promoted the spirit of cooperation and contribution and solidarity among institutions and individuals. Our cordial Congratulations to all of you for the success of this outstanding gathering and the result is brought over the past two days. Uh, the energy of the faith and commitment has been present throughout the sessions with uh, perspectives drawing on minds, souls and hearts to shape views on the many complex questions uh, of faith in action. 
That was really the most wonderful part of this. And Dunkley, we live with shared global problems, challenges. The way forward, therefore, is through minds, hearts, and hands working together. Our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, taught us that it's necessary to have pure and sincere intentions to qualify deeds and action as good and right. We humans are source of good and peace, but we can also turn to become sources of damage and trans transgressions and destruction sometimes if we lose the path of faith and the connection with God. Allah the Almighty said in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 195, and spend of your substance in the cause of God and make not your own hands contribute to destruction, but do good for Allah, love good, uh, for Allah, God, love those who do good. So it's very clear when we walk the path of faith, it's all about being good and doing good. Last, last but not least, I remind you, our, uh, our young people, of the noble cause and the mission born on our collective shoulders, that it's to serve humanity, build a better world for future generations, show humility and dedication, and not to forget that best of us in the sight of God are those who serve the people and extend kindness, care, and good to all. As Dr. Azza kept saying, the leaders are those who serve. God the Almighty said in chapter 49 in the Quran, verse 13, people, we created all of you from single men and single women and made you into races and tribes so that you should recognize one another. In God's eyes, the most honored of you are the ones most mindful of him. Mm -hmm. God is all-knowing, all-aware. He also said in chapter 40, verse 64, it is Allah who made for you the earth a place of settlements and the sky a structure and formed you and perfected your forms and provided you with good things. That's Allah, your Lord. Then blessed Allah, Lord of the words. I pray that our hearts, work, actions, research, decisions will contribute to our youth strengthen and increasing determination and engagement with their communities and dedication to building a better world. Lastly, on behalf of the ICYF team and the rest of my partners and friends, it gives us pleasure to express commitment to work together to serve youth in, the aspects, in all aspects and help them reach their potential and fulfill their dreams. To our attendees and all young people, thank you so much for all your inspiring uh, contributions and giving us the chance to reflect on our faith in these two days. The most beautiful gift we have is our faith. This is, will enable us to see what we need to do next. Dear friends in uh, Religions for Peace, uh, especially the two wonderful MCs, the wonderful people sitting beside, be, be behind the screens, all of you, no exceptions. Uh, we are so thankful for all the efforts you put together and the remarkable events you brought uh, to us. May Allah bless and uh, thank all of you. Thank you very much for your kind atten uh, inter uh, attention and see you all, inshallah, in up uh, our up um, uh, upcoming events. Until then, I wish you, inshallah, prosperity, health, blessings and happiness and keep thinking and keep connecting with Allah with God and keep connected together because we are a human family we are meant to be together in many other occasions to think and reflect on our faith wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh thank you thank you very much dr fadila for your concluding remarks ladies and gentlemen dear brothers and sisters we are now at the end of our symposium. And I thank you everyone for participating to this symposium during these two days. Uh, now let me inform you that all the contribution that has been presented during these uh, two days of symposium will be put together and published. They will also be shared uh, during the G20 Interfaith Forum. And then uh, in uh, RFP, Regions, Regions for Peace, 
conference that will be held in Germany uh, early October. So thank you very much for uh, being present during this uh, symposium. Thank you and goodbye.